Welcome to Marantis Labs Tech Talks, where we dive into cloud native topics, use cases, tutorials, and many more to educate you all. I'm Avinas, Senior Solutions Architect and Developer Advocate here at Marantis. I'll be your host today. Joining me today, Eric Gregory, to talk about containerizing things. We encourage questions so much. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll get through them throughout the session. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eric to pick up today's presentation. Eric, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us. Uh, so today's workshop is on containerizing your applications. And what that's going to mean is learning container fundamentals and best practices by moving a monolithic app to containerized services. So two important things to note up front. First, this is targeted towards beginners to containerization who are just starting out on their cloud native journey, uh, maybe want to take the first steps that are ultimately going to lead to working with a container orchestrator like Kubernetes. Uh, second thing to note, this is a hands-on workshop. Uh, so we, you'll, you'll be downloading some software, you'll be playing with some code, uh, and hopefully you'll have some hands-on sense for what it takes to start moving a monolithic app to containers. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm senior technical writer at Marantis and the author of Learn Containers Five Minutes at a Time, and I co-host the Radio Cloud Native podcast and live stream with Nick Chase. Uh, I'm a former computer science instructor who works on Kubernetes, containers, open source, DevOps, and more. Okay, so to drill down a little bit, our objectives for today are to migrate a monolithic web app built on Node.js and MySQL to containerized services. Second, we want to learn core container concepts like volumes, port forwarding, and networking. And finally, we want to develop an understanding of container best practices. We're not going to be able to be totally comprehensive in the time we have today, of course, but we want to make sure we get the fundamentals, the things you really want to know when you're starting out with containers. So we do have a few prerequisites. Uh, first off, you're going to need to follow along with the exercise Docker Engine or Docker Desktop. And it's going to be helpful to have some basic command line fluency. And I really mean basic things like LS, CD. Um, and uh, optionally, it'll be helpful if you have some basic Node.js fluency, but that's not a big deal. If you don't, this isn't focused on programming. We're really focused on moving a pre-existing app to containers. OK, so before we get started, let's define our terms and make sure we're on the same page as to what we're talking about and why. So for a high level definition of containers, we can say that they are sandboxed software environments that share common dependencies, such as the operating systems kernel. More technically, we can say that containers are groups of processes isolated by kernel namespaces, control groups, and restrictions on root privileges and system calls. And we can see here in this diagram, we have three containerized apps, each with their own distinct binaries and libraries, but then they're all running on the same container engine, ultimately running on the same operating system kernel, and ultimately running on the same infrastructure. So why would we bother to isolate our processes? You may wish to keep processes separate for the sake of security so that one program can't access data from another. You may need to be certain that a process doesn't have access to root privileges and system calls. Or it may be a simple matter of resource efficiency and system hygiene. For example, on a given machine, you may have one process that relies on Python 2.7 and another that calls for 3.1. Once such competing dependency requirements start to compound, that can be a real headache. So process isolation goes a long way toward preventing or resolving those problems. And once we start containerizing applications, we start to find some real benefits that can dramatically change how we deliver software. We'll find that our apps and services can become much more portable and much more scalable. So we've already used the term monolith a couple of times. And if you haven't heard the term in software development before, you might think we're talking about the movie 2001 with the big black rock. But in software architecture, monolith is really our term of contrast with a modular containerized architecture. A monolithic architecture is one that integrates all of the modules and functionalities of an application in one big code base. 
this is an old school architectural style and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, sometimes we start talking about uh, more modern architectures like microservices and people say, that's the way you have to do it. That's not quite true. You know, monolithic architectures can be highly organized and for small teams with small apps that they don't expect to scale, that can make sense. But if you're working on a very large team or you expect your app to scale out and your code base to grow, it often makes sense to opt for a services and microservices based architecture instead. Isolated services mean that you can assign dedicated teams to each module and they can develop with the tools that make sense for them. The strategy also means that specific functionalities of the app can be scaled independently. So as we've said before, we're gonna use Docker as our container tool today. And we should probably kind of define our terms here too. In casual conversation, the term Docker can mean a lot of things. It might refer to the company, Docker Inc., or the suite of tools that they package in their Docker desktop application, which I mentioned as a possible prerequisite before. But all of that is built around Docker Engine, the application that builds the sandbox walls and passes messages from the processes inside to the kernel. So when we refer to Docker today, we're talking about the container engine. It sets up structures like control groups that isolate containerized processes from the rest of the system and at least initially from one another. So hopefully you already have Docker ready to go, but if not, you can follow these links to install it. And thank you Avinash for throwing those in the chat. Uh, I'll give you a moment to copy these links if you need, but don't worry, you'll have a chance to install in a moment. All right, so first we're gonna download the monolithic version of the app that we'll be working with today. And this is a simple to-do app built with Node.js, MySQL, and the Express Handlebars view engine. If you'd like to test the monolithic version of the app, you'll need Node and MySQL installed in your local environment. You'll also need a database called to-do underscore db set up in, the My in MySQL. I'll show you what all that looks like in a moment, but note that this is not required. We're gonna be doing all our real work in containers. So unless you just wanna play around with the monolithic version of the app, installing Node and MySQL on your system or setting up that database, none of that's necessary. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to go ahead and clone the Git repository here. Uh, and this is a good chance for anyone who needs Docker installed to get that taken care of as well. I'm here to answer any questions you have while you're getting that set up. And after two or three minutes, after you've had a chance to kind of get going, uh, we'll take a look at the app as it is now before migrating. And a quick reminder, uh, you can use the Q&A section in the uh, to put any questions in there or use the chat window and we will be uh, addressing them as throughout the session. Thank Absolutely. You. Try to take about one more minute to get that cloned and ready, and uh, we'll we'll move on after that. But if you still need to get uh, Docker installed, don't worry, you'll have a chance to catch up.
All right, we're going to move ahead in a second. Does anyone uh, need time to clone the repository? We've got that uh, that link there in the chat, so we should be good. All right. So hopefully you're done, but it's all right if you need another minute or two, because we're going to take a quick tour of the app as it is now. So I'm going to jump over to the terminal. So I'm already here in the to-do monolith directory, and I can start the app with, well, npm start. So now we're on localhost 3000. So if we jump over there, here we have a super basic to-do app. We can add tasks, we can mark them as complete. Hey, doing that right now. And we can mark them as incomplete if we decide that we haven't finished it. And we can delete tasks. And we see, do something. So super basic to do app. Let's go ahead and look under the hood and see how all of the pieces connect. So we're going to jump over to VS Code, and here we have our project directory. We're basically following an MVC model. So we have separate directories for our data model and views, there and there. And our index.js file here at the top level is linking everything together. So if we drill down a little bit, we see we have a simple script handling our database connection in the models folder. In node modules, we have the various modules and their dependencies that we're using in the app. Our CSS styles are in the public folder. In the views directory, we have a couple of nested templates. And these are in handlebars format, so we've got main and index. And last, we have the top level index.js and package.json. Okay, so this is the code base we're looking to migrate. So where do we want to start? This is a good place to introduce best practice number one, run one service per container. We want our containers to have one job. That's going to make our overall architecture more comprehensible and easier to maintain not to mention more portable and scalable. So for our very simple containerized architecture, we're going to have two containers, one for the app and one for the database. If we wanted to decompose our app further, we could. We could break it down into components like front end and back end, and then further into different functionalities, managing the API, running authors uh, off if we wanted to add a login, and so on. But for now, we just want to get our feet wet with containers. So let's start with the database. So for the monolithic app, I already had my local MySQL server running, and it already had its root password set up. But we're going to need everything running in containers. And before we can do that, we need to take an even bigger step back and think about the resources our containers might need. The database will need persistent storage. And all of our containers will need an isolated virtual network where they can communicate with each other via DNS. Docker has provisions for both of these needs. For storage, it has volumes. These are portable and persistent, so containers can store their data independently. And that brings us to our second best practice. Number two, containers should be stateless and immutable. Containers shouldn't use data stored inside the container itself because we want to be able to treat them as totally interchangeable. We need to be able to spin up and shut down a container without worrying about losing data. We call this idea statelessness. The container just runs a single process. It doesn't change state. This is related to the concept of being immutable, which means unchanging. The contents of a container shouldn't change in the course of operation. Again, this makes your containers interchangeable. So, all right, 
we get to get into the command line here. Uh, to add a volume, we're going to enter docker volume create to do vol. And to do vol is the arbitrary name I've chosen here to assign to this volume that we're creating. So this command is creating an independent isolated storage volume managed by Docker. Now, I should note that there is a second way to add persistent storage called a bind mount, which connects a container directly to the file system of the host machine. That's not great for production for a lot of reasons, replicability, security, and so on. But it can be useful for development, and we'll actually see that strategy in a little bit. So, OK, before we move on, let's create our volume. We'll open a new tab in the terminal. Try to spell volume correctly. All right, there's our volume created. OK, so we added the volume. Now we're going to add our user-defined network. So let's go ahead and type this in now, and then we'll walk through what we've done. So docker network create the bridge to do net. OK, so let's, let's walk through this. We called up Docker. We said we wanted to create a network. And then we used the D flag to specify that we're using the bridge driver. And then we're naming this network to do net. Again, an arbitrarily chosen name that's going to help me keep track of what this network is for, what kind of containers are going to be running on it. Not too complicated. Now, just for reference, your driver options that you can specify with that D flag are bridge, overlay, and custom drivers. And bridge networks allow containers within the network, all of which must be on the same Docker daemon host to communicate with one another while isolating them from other networks. This is probably the most common that you're going to see. Uh, there's actually a default bridge network that uh, new containers will be assigned to if you don't specify a network, and that is a bridge network. But one important thing to note about that default bridge is that it doesn't allow uh, uh, resolution by DNS. So if you want to have multiple containers communicating and resolving by DNS, which we do, uh, then you're going to want to create a user-defined network. Now, two other options are overlay networks and custom drivers. Overlay networks allow containers within the network, which may be spread across multiple Docker daemon hosts, to communicate with one another while isolating them from other networks. This driver is used by Swarm for container orchestration. So if you think you might be heading towards Swarm, that's something to note. And then finally, custom drivers allow for custom network rules. OK, now it's time to get a MySQL container running. And this is a slightly more complicated command. So before we actually run it, let's walk through everything that we're doing here. So first, we're using the docker run command. That's one of our most fundamental Docker commands. It's simply going to run a containerized process. The rest of our arguments are going to define that process. So the IT argument means we're running this container interactively, so we can start a bash session inside. The network argument specifies that the container is going to use our user-defined to-do net network. The V for volume argument says that, that the container will use our new volume and associates the volume with the directory in the MySQL container where it expects to be able to save persistent data. This is a database. Obviously, it's going to need to be able to save persistent data. The D argument means we're going to run the container in detached mode, which means the container process won't be bound to our current terminal session. We'd be able to keep working rather than just watch it run. Uh, that's not going to be as relevant to the way we're running it here because we're going to be jumping inside. The E argument specifies an environment variable, in this case, a root user password for the database. I'm using the password Oktoberfest here, and I'll be using it throughout for our database password. And finally, we're going to build from the official Docker Hub image for MySQL and then open a bash shell. Now, I know you're probably itching to actually run a container, but this last point is important, and it's a good place to talk about our third best practice. 
you can think of a container image as a photograph, a snapshot of a container's file system state frozen in time. When we conjure up an image with Docker, it can feel like magic, but the image is coming from somewhere. By default, that's Docker Hub, though you can also use other registries, private registries, and so on. Docker Hub is public, so vulnerabilities can creep in. It's a good idea to check the source for any image you use. So we can look at the Docker Hub page for MySQL, and let's do that now. All right, so here we'll find that this has the Docker official image label, which means that it's curated by Docker themselves. That can put us at ease somewhat. We can also browse around the page to learn a little more about using the container and different versions of the container. And in general, in practice, you're going to want to pay attention to both version numbers and versions that may be designed to take up minimal space. So our third best practice here, carefully evaluate your base image, has a couple of different dimensions. You want to evaluate it for resource efficiency. You want to evaluate it for its source, for security. Uh, the, the point here is to not take for granted the, the magical summoning command on an image. You want to think about what it is and where it's coming from. All right, now we can run our MySQL container. So we're gonna take this command and enter that in the terminal. So docker run name do MySQL. I'm going to use the to do net network. We're gonna specify a volume our to-do vol that we created. And then we're mapping that to ver lib s equal d. We're also specifying an environment variable, which is the root password. We're running this in detached mode with the D argument, which uh, means that it's going to run in the background and it's not going to take over our shell session. And then we're using the MySQL base image. Okay, so everything worked there. Now we're going to use the Docker exec command to jump into the container itself. All right, we're now inside the file system of the MySQL container. This is a whole new MySQL server from the one on my local system. So I'm going to need to go ahead and create the to-do underscore DB database. We can do this manually using the MySQL shell. So we can simply MySQL command, say that we want to log in as the root user and offer a password. And here, we're going to enter the password that we set, Oktoberfest. And once we're inside the MySQL shell, we're going to enter the command create database. If not exists, do underscore db semicolon. Great. That worked just fine. And now, we can exit, we'll stay in that container and go ahead and open a new terminal tab. Before we move on, we're gonna to want to make a change to our models slash task model JS file to reflect our new host name. Now I got a little hasty and already changed this, but you can see right here, this is to do MySQL. It was localhost. So we're not on localhost anymore. We're going to use the name of the container, and that's going to be able to resolve via DNS since we're on a user-defined bridge network. So let's save that. Note that we have the database that we just created specified there. And now we can move on to think a little bit about our app container. So here's the command that we're going to use to get our container up and running. Before we actually run it, let's talk through these arguments. So we've got docker run 
name to do app, network to do net, the P flag, 3000, 3000, E, MySQL PW equals Oktoberfest, the IT argument, mount, and then we're using a bind mount. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we're defining the working directory where we're going to uh, start in, in our new container. So well, let's go through that in a little more detail. We're using the to do net network. The P flag is letting us map the container port 3000 to port 3000 on our local system. Like last time, the E argument defines an environment variable, and we'll talk more about this specific one in a little bit. The IT argument means we're running this container interactively so we can start a bash session inside. We're using the mount argument to connect the container directly to our hard drive, and we're telling it to start the mount at our present working directory. And in this case, that's right where we are for our project. We're also telling Docker to map that directory to user slash source slash app inside the container file system. Now, this is the other style of, of uh, giving your containers persistent storage that I talked about a little bit earlier. We don't really want to use this in production in most cases, but it makes sense for a development environment like this. Now, finally, the W argument is going to define a working directory inside the container. That's where we'll land when we run bash. So, okay, let's actually run this. Great, all right, we're inside the container. But the container file system is mapped to the host machine. So anything that we do in this directory will be reflected on the host machine. And we can test that out. We can use our graphical file manager. I'll just use finder to delete something inside the folder. So let's delete the node modules. Those are pretty important. And now they're gone. See, they're not there anymore. All right, our file systems match. So let's go ahead and reinstall those modules and we'll use the containers instance of node. So we can run npm install. And there we are. Our modules are coming back. They're repopulating from the specifications in our package.json file. Now, once this is finished installing, we can run node index.js. And this is going to launch our app. The web server has started on port 3000. It's connected to the database. So everything's looking good. Let's check it out in the browser. Beautiful. There's our app. And it's all functional. So everything's connected. Everything's working smoothly. We now have a containerized app retrieving and sending data to our containerized database. Perfect. Except we have one more pesky best practice to think about. Fortunately, we can use options like secrets and environment variables to solve this problem. Today, I'll show you how we can use environment variables. So you probably noticed a couple of slides ago how we slipped an environment variable definition into our to-do app container. That was MySQL underscore PW, and we said it was equal to Oktoberfest. So now we're going to make use of it. In task model JS, we're going to add a new line. So I'm going to bring that up in VS Code here. We're where we want to be. And our new line is going to define a new variable. Say so let dbpw, we're going to let it equal process env dot mysql underscore pw, the environment variable that we defined. Now we're going to change the password definition line to pick dollar bracket then the variable that we just defined dbpw. And then close bracket, close tick. 
Now let's save. So what's this doing? This is piping in that environment variable into our task model. And it's going to use that rather than storing our password out in the open. So now that we have our container contents where we want them, we can go ahead and build our images. We're going to create a new file without an extension called Dockerfile in the root of our project directory. So I'm going to open the terminal. We'll just create a new tab. And I'm going to use nano to create this Docker file because it'll create a new file and then launch us right into it. And inside the file, we can list specifications for our image build. We can say we want this to build from node and define an environment variable. Find a working directory. We can say that we want to copy the content of the directory we're in into the root of the container file system that we're creating. We also want to, after saving this, create a docker ignore file. I'm going to do this the same way. This is going to exclude listed files. And all we have to do is write Docker file here. And the reason is really simple. We just went to a little bit of trouble to make sure that our password is not being stored in the open here. So we want to make sure we don't just store the Docker file that would give the same privileges uh, in, in the open as well. We don't want to include that as part of the image. Uh, so we'll save our Docker ignore file and bop out of there. And now I'm going to stop my containers. And I'll actually leave that one running. We've stopped the to-do app, and now we're going to use a Docker file to uh, build an image. So we're going to say Docker image build. So what's happening here? The T argument is assigning a tag or a name for the image. The dot at the end tells Docker where to look for the Docker file, in this case, just in our present directory. And after the build completes, the image will be saved on our local machine. Fantastic. The other way to create an image is to simply uh, commit a running container, sort of like taking a live photograph. And we'll do that with the MySQL container. We can simply run. And there we go. Now, both of our images are saved locally. If you'd like, you can upload them to Docker Hub after signing up for an account. That is a simple matter of Docker login, then tagging your app with your username and then the app name, and then using Docker push to push to username slash what you've named your app. Uh, also note that as we're kind of closing down here, system hygiene is important. We don't want a bunch of unused images and containers piling up on our system. And you know, for that matter, that goes for our network and for our volumes. These are all resources that hang out in our system. So if you'd like to delete an image, you can do that with Docker image RM and then the container name. And you can check to make sure that it's deleted and see what else might be hanging out with Docker image LS. Uh, you can view all containers on your system, whether they're running or not, with Docker Container LS uh, with the A flag. Uh, and then you can stop containers with Docker Container Stop 
and the container name, and you can delete them with Docker container RM and then the container name. Uh, you can also use Docker volume uh, RM and then the name of the volume to get rid of that and Docker network RM and then the name of the network to get rid of that. So that brings us pretty much to the end of our presentation. If you'd like to review any of the concepts here, you can check out my free ebook from Marantis Press, Learn Containers Five Minutes at a Time at www.marantis.com slash press. And next steps, you'll receive an email with a recording, slides, a survey, and upcoming sessions. Uh, our next one is building my first Kubernetes app. And in this workshop, you'll go through each step of building a Kubernetes app with an example elaborating on the concepts and you'll walk away able to create and deploy the app in the a Lens Dev Cluster or Mirantis Kubernetes Engine. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we'll see you in the next session. Thank you.